You guys see these antennas? Yes, they are fantastic. But you don't need them to have a good ham radio station. Stick around. Tim Kreitz here. I hope this episode finds you happy, healthy, and at peace. I got back into ham radio during the pandemic last year. I've been back into it for six or eight months. I've been a licensed ham radio operator for 20, oh gosh, 23 years now, almost. Yeah, a little over 23 years. But I was largely inactive for about 19 of that. So as I said, during the pandemic, I was at home a lot, as most of us were, and I decided to pull all of my old ham radio gear out of the closet, hook it back up, see if it still worked. And it did, and I started having fun. And so I started studying for my extra class amateur radio operator's license, which is the highest license you can get in the amateur service. Took a Took, did my testing, passed all of it, got my extra class, and started fiddling around with building a base station. The base station initially consisted of two HF radios and a dual band UHF VHF radio, but I've since gone to just one HF rig to save space. I like keeping things simple. If you're familiar with this channel at all, you know I believe in simplicity in all things, simplicity in life simplicity in material things, simplicity in, well, just about everything. So, I put this station together and started doing really well with it. In fact, I started doing a bunch of DX with it, which for those of you who don't know, that's distance, that's long distance communications halfway across the world, other side of the world, if you will. And it's just a very simple station that runs 100 watts. And when people see my logbook and see my contacts on like QRZ.com and that sort of thing, especially new hams, because a lot of people got into ham radio. Oh, my camera fell. Let's see if we can, let's see. Let's see if that'll stay. A lot of people got into ham radio during the pandemic or got back into ham radio during the pandemic because we, we were all stuck at home so much. And so I've been getting a lot of questions about how, you know, how are you getting Asiatic Russia? How are you getting Hawaii? How are you getting, you know, South Africa with a 100 watt station in your garage? So that antenna array that you saw at the beginning of the video, that's the W5 QGG ham radio station for the Midland Amateur Radio Club, which I've been a member of on and off again for 23 years. And it's wonderful. It's, it's a really badass setup. They've got an Elecraft radio in there and an ICOM radio in there and it's and it's really cool and some amplifiers and all kinds of groovy stuff i wish i had a key i would have taken you inside but my point in making this video is is just to let you know you don't have to have that you don't have to have a setup that crazy going back to my simplicity of life philosophy uh, I have a small house, a small simple house on a small simple piece of property and I don't have room for an antenna set up like that. So I'm going to take you back to my house, I'm going to show you my ham station set up and how simple it is and my antennas and how simple they are and how they work, how I've got them all set up and how you can do it too. I've taken a lot of questions from new hams and from people returning to ham radio over the past six or eight months asking me, man, how are you making all these global contacts with just that little setup you've got? It's easy. Okay, so here it is, and here is how it works. The 50 amp power supply here, which I will now turn on, it powers the 100 watt Yesu FT450. 
Now, if you follow me on social media or you follow this channel or have been part of any of these discussions, you'll remember I did have two HF radios running off of this power supply. I also had my old 1980s Kenwood TS-130S, which I've now taken out of service. I messed with it for about six months and had a great time with it, and it's a great radio. But this one has more power and more functionality and also... Adding another HF rig into this messed up my system. I wanted to have everything for the moment in this little compartment underneath my top toolbox. And having the Kenwood did not facilitate that. So uh, right now I'm monitoring 10 meters and 10 meters has not been open. We're at the bottom of the very beginning of solar cycle 25 and the higher HF bands are not working very well. You have to catch them sporadically. So I will generally set... So I'll sit right here on 28.400 megahertz and just listen if I'm not doing anything else to see if the band opens up, see if I hear anybody calling. I uh, haven't heard anything today, but I also I haven't been in here a whole lot today. I've been working and kind of have my work day finished, and so I decided to make this video. This power supply, which I will now turn on, this runs this... UHF VHF dual bander that I bought when I got back into ham radio back in the fall of last year and there's a couple of my buddies talking that's Mar that's uh, Jonathan talking I'll go to a frequency where nobody is uh, just so we don't have to listen to people talk um, this is a plain Jane dual band FM UHF VHF it's two meter 70 centimeter FM only no sideband no no digital like it doesn't do any of that sort of thing and uh, it works fine and it's 25 watts I generally keep it on 25 watts uh, unless I'm talking really close and and then it'll go down to about 15 ish watts between 10 and 15 watts and it'll also go down to five watts this radio consistently swings about 105 watts. I run it on 10 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters, and 40 meters right now. So let's go to 20 meters and see if 20 meters is active right now. And I'll show you how I've got this set up. I'm using two antennas. I'm using a 40 meter dipole that I built myself from scratch. I'll show you the antenna setup in just a few minutes. We'll get to that. And I'm also using a vertical 10 meter steel whip that I have a huge counterpoise on that I use for 10 meters and 20 meters. So the 40 meter dipole, which I am not on right now, this is the 40 meter dipole. This is the 20 meter vertical with the big counterpoise on it. And it actually runs through this tuner. So put this on 20 meters and now I've already got this tuned. So I'm tuned for 20 meters here. If I switch here and I go to this setting, that puts me on the dipole and the dipole is tuned here. So I'm on the tuned side of coax one input on this tuner, which tunes me for 40 meter. If I go to bypass and go to coax two, and bypass this tuner, that takes me up to this tuner, which is tuned for 20 meters, which I can also bypass or put on any other band I want. Right now it's it, it's on 20 meters and I'm monitoring 20 meters and I'm not hearing a whole heck of a lot. Mm, terrible conditions today. Wow. Not even slow scan TV. All right, so not a whole lot going on on single sideband. Oh, wait, here's something. A couple of guys rag chewing. So ham radio is a weird deal. We, we build radios and we build tuners and we build antennas and we put the systems together and then we get on air and we talk about the radios we have and the antennas we built and the systems we put together. Strange hobby, but it's very, very fun. There's actually a lot more to it facet-wise than just that. I mean, it's it's indispensable during times of emergencies and, and a bunch of other stuff. But these guys are just rag-chewing on 20 meters during the day. All right, let's go see the antenna setup, and I'll show you how that works. Hey, f*** off. Go away. I'm trying to make a video. F off. 
Okay, here's my antenna mast. It's telescoping mast. And if you look real closely up there, you will see a stainless steel vertical whip that's about eight feet tall. The top of that is close to uh, 30 feet, 28 feet, something like that. And that has a counterpoise that runs down the pole. And you can kind of see where it turns around there. But it runs down one side of the shield side and loops back up and connects to the left side of the shield side. So what that translates to is on 10 meters, it's a quarter wave vertical with a half wave counterpoise. And on 20 meters, it's an eighth wave vertical with a quarter wave counterpoise. That's how the vertical works. I didn't expect it to work quite honestly. It was a total experiment. I figured it would fail. I mean, I knew it would tune 10 meters, but I had no idea whether or not it would tune 20 meters and it tunes 20 meters great. I'll show you some of my contacts and my signal reports once we're done looking at the antennas. Now let's look at the dipole. Okay. Here we are at rooftop level of my porch, my back porch. And here is one of the legs of the dipole going to the telescoping pole. All right, oh, by the way, by, as you can tell by all of the chattering birds who are at war with each other, these don't work. Don't waste your money. They work for about a week, and then no matter where you move them or what you do to them, they're absolutely useless. So anyhow, as you can see here, I had to lengthen this dipole and I would recommend if you guys are going to build a dipole of any kind, cut it long. <laughs> it's one of the lessons I forgot from long ago, uh, back in the 90s when I went through this the first time. You always cut a dipole long because they're a lot easier to shorten than they are to lengthen. But at any rate, I did lengthen this dipole slightly and I did it with slightly heavier gauge wire, uh, which is a good deal, you know, because all the voltage ends up out at the ends and all the radiation ends up closer to the feed point on a dipole. And uh, how it works is very, very simple. It has a center feed point. Both legs are equal length. And I've got one coming down into the backyard and I have it secured to this cinder block on my porch, uh, guarded by this useless owl. And then the other leg, which I'll show you in a second, goes to the front yard and I have it tied into a tree. The feed point is at about 21 feet, 22 feet, something like that. And then the slope down uh, to about uh, 12 feet, you know, 11 feet, something like that. So that's how that works. And let's go, go around and show you the front. Okay, so in the front yard, you can see how the other element of the dipole connects to that tree right there. Very simple, not much to it. It's all about building the dipole correctly is mainly what it's about. Now I want to show you my logbook and show you some of the contacts and signal reports I've gotten just doing 100 watts with a little FT450 radio on those homemade antennas. So here is Italy that I got just the other night and I received a 5.8 signal report with 100 watts from West Texas to Italy. It's kind of cool. This guy's really cool. Uh, Roberto, he loves working DX and he always, uh, he calls for the West Coast a lot. So I was really surprised that, uh, I was really surprised that I got him that night. This is Russia. This is European Russia. Uh, this guy's name is Anatoly Gugnaev. What a, <laughs> what a Russian name that is. Had a nice little conversation with him. He gave me a 5.3. Conditions were pretty bad, but still that's European Russia on a hundred watts with some wire that I bought from the hardware store and built an antenna out of. Incidentally, here is what the antenna looked like before I put it up on the, uh, on the, on the pole. Very, very simple, basic run of the mill, 40 meter dipole. It was just cut correctly and put together correctly and it works great. All right. Uh, oh, this was kind of neat. They're running this special event station. This is a uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway special event station. I got them. There's Canada. Anytime I do DX, you can see where I'm, I'm, I mark it. So I mark it DX. This is Venezuela. This is another neat one that uh, this is the first time I've got it since I've come back to amateur radio. Actually, the first time I've ever gotten it. I got to make a contact with the Voice of America. This was a uh, WC8 VOA, Voice of America. And this was a Bethany relay station. I talked to an operator named Melissa. She was real nice. And 5959, that's up, uh, in, New, up in New England, I do believe. Uh, Chile, Mexico, Bulgaria. 
I got a 5.5 from Bulgaria. That's not bad with 100 watts. Uh, Chile, conditions were real bad this, this night. We gave each other 3 by 3s If you don't understand how signal reports work in amateur radio, 5, this first number is the signal quality. So that you'll hear guys say, man, you're Q5 all the way. And then this is signal strength. And how that works is on an HF radio, if you notice right here, you've got these numbers and they go to nine. So five by nine would be quality five, signal strength nine. And then if you say, man, you are five, nine plus 20, that means that your signal's up here, five, nine plus 40, five, nine plus 60. That's, that's how that works on these signal reports if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with it. So man, it goes on and on. Spain, a five, seven signal report with hundred watts talking to Spain. This goes on Asiatic Russia. Uh, I got a five, nine going to Asiatic Russia with hundred watts. Uh, it, it, Spain again. Uh, I've got France in here, Martinique, a whole bunch of Caribbean stations, the Bahamas, lots of Canada, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. It goes on and on and on, all with 100 watts. So you guys that are getting interested in ham radio and wanting to get your your uh, go through the licensing process, look, I got the USS Midway CV41. That was kind of cool. Uh, I'm telling you, you don't need to go spend a whole big ton of money on a thousand watt 1500 watt amplifier you just don't need it even with conditions bad like they are right now with the low solar activity okay i think that's going to just about do it i just want to show you a couple more things quickly number one i do use a desk mic with the yesu this is a sure 550 tango series 2 550t series 2 these are fantastic desk mics they sound great especially for dx and they're very easy to wire for yesu in fact they're uh, easy to wire for just about anything. I have one that's wired for Kenwood as well. So just a little something there, uh, just so I can say I showed you pretty much everything with regard to the ham shack. The other thing that you're going to need if you're going to start building antennas is you are going to need, where should I put this? I'll just put it right here. You're going to need an antenna analyzer and uh, it's an investment of up to several hundred dollars, but if you really want to build good antennas that will tune correctly on the bands you want to transceive on, you need one of these. Every antenna setup that I've done so far since coming back to ham radio, I have analyzed with this unit and uh, highly, highly recommend it. So with that, I'm going to end this video. And for those of you who normally watch this channel because I do a lot of motorcycle content. Yeah, this was way different. But for those of you who have absolutely no idea who I am and are looking to get into HF radio, looking to get your ham license or looking to come back to it and set up a simple station that works really, really well that you can have a lot of fun on. Hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight on that. We'll catch you guys next time on Tim Kreitz Adventures. Bye. Mm -hmm.